Okay, um... Well, I accidentally skipped the first level, so... Uh, I'm basically just gonna keep killing myself until I can uh, restart from the beginning. And I'm hoping that doesn't get rid of my items, but I can't remember correctly. But anyway, during this time, I think I'd like to address uh, something that's come up recently. Uh, and that is the, uh, the fact that Nintendo is apparently claiming ownership of Let's Plays. You know, they kind of see the, the idea that, oh, well, it's our games, and you're playing our games, so it belongs to us. And the thing is, I really do very much disagree with this, because, you know, you're, you're not the one... Pl uh, when somebody is playing your game, they are kind of transforming it in their own way. As people have said before, the art of games is not only in the hands of the designer, but it's also in the player. In a sense, most games are kind of incomplete without the hand of a player in it. And... Like, if it was you specifically playing the game and you also invented it, then that specific uh, gameplay segment, that's something that you own. But that doesn't necessarily imply that you own, you know, me playing this game or whatever. Um, but because of that, I'm sort of discouraged from playing Nintendo games. So that's why, I, like, I was eventually planning to doing, after, like, almost immediately after Persona, I was planning for my next uh, last play to be... Uh, or long let's play to be Paper Mario Thousand Year Door, but this has caused me to reconsider that. And I, I know people are gonna say, "What are you greedy?" No, the thing is, I barely make any money off this. Like it's it's nothing. Like I think it was the last month it was literally two dollars. I think for me. Um, uh, but here's the thing: when I see guys like Chugga Conroy or Nintendo Capri Sun, guys who actually put a, a lot of effort into what they do, guys who very passionately defend Nintendo, guys who are, you know, the biggest marks of them all, and, you know, put a lot of work into their fandom, you know, and to see kind of Nintendo pretty much destroy their livelihood, or at least I think that, I'm, at least that's how, kind of how I, I see it, you know, it, it just makes you think, do I really want to support them by, you know, giving them more money by allowing them to put ads over my videos? No, and my dad has always told me this, D never let uh, somebody make money off something you work hard on. Because, you know, and, because, yeah, that's kind of it. And the reason I'm bringing this up is not only because of Super Mario Bros. 3, but also because uh, I said I was going to do the lost levels after this. And the recent events have caused me to reconsider those actions. So now I'm sorry to anyone who wanted to see it. But after Super Mario Bros. 3, I will not do the Lost Levels, which is kind of a shame because I had actually practiced the Lost Levels and I would already beaten it for the first time that I actively remember. Um, and hopefully this wasn't too long of a start, but this will also explain why I'm choosing not to go and doing heavy editing as I have before because I just don't kind of feel like I have the will to do it. Anyway, I will continue. Anyway, welcome back, folks, to this part of Let's Play Super Mario Bros. 3. In the last part, I had, um, fuck, what did I do? Oh, yeah, I went to the, um, my memory is ass. It is garbage. Friggin' hell, how do I forget what I, what I just did? Oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah, I went to the skies. In this part, I'm going to the ice. And if you're wondering how I somehow lost, like, um, uh, like, the footage for this level, what the thing was, I played this level as a, uh, what fuck, I played this level as a way of syncing my audio for ending my, for the last big recording session I did, because what I do is, I have my audio, in the beginning, before I start recording, what I do is I, I think I've said this before, I jam my microphone into my speakers or headset and, uh, like, just try to match up the audio. And then I do that at the end because a lot of times the, the audio sometimes gets laggy or whatever. And that was a really short stage. I'm hoping I didn't lose my items, but that makes, but I think that is what happened. Oh, wow, I still have all my items. Now... I'm going to demonstrate, uh, because I'd like to re remain some dignity, even though I'm not going to you know, do heavy editing anymore. I'd like to demonstrate what some of these things do. For example, this is what the music box does. It makes the uh, Hammer Brothers and all other er enemies like them completely um, just 
out. Like they, there's nothing they, uh, they're, they're, they are no threat to you. And this is what the cloud does. Notice how I am on a level uh, right now. But if I put on the cloud, right over. And as you can see, the music box also makes it so that the um, Hammer Brother does not damage me. Anyway, I go into this red place, which I believe gives me one of the most overpowered moves, uh, overpowered suits in the entire game. And that's um, the Hammer Suit. This will actually give you a new type of fireball, that's, which is pretty much the hammers from uh, the Hammer Brothers, as, you, as I'm sure you expected. And I believe I was talking earlier about how Let's Plays are themselves sort of a transformative art. Well, that's how I sort of see it. But, you know, then there's the, the trouble of, like, what Let's Plays aren't. Because, to some extent, I could understand someone saying, Alright, well, a Let's Play of Metal Gear Solid isn't really that much of a Let's Play, because you're just, like, watching a bunch of cutscenes. And to that, I sort of understand that. This is why I don't... I didn't have that much of a problem with Konami, like, filing, um content claims on my on my Metal Gear Solid runs because I'm like yeah the games are pretty much like nothing but cutscenes and I could understand that and hell even when I got flagged for uh, Resident Evil 5 when it was like it told me yeah uh, there's copyrighted music on this because apparently the musicians have rights to their music and I'm like you know what that's fine with me too you know this is why, like, if I ever did, like, a Grand, uh, which I'm, I don't think you're ever going to see an LP of Grand, the Grand Theft Auto games, no one is ever going to try to claim that, you know, the music in that game is not someone else's property, because it's a licensed soundtrack. Um, but the thing is with this, with this sort of game, it, it's sort of my interaction with the game that I think makes it the part of... Uh, you know, part of mine, if you will. That's a very, very weird way of putting it. But then there are other games you could argue. Like if, say, Grim Fandango, or, or hell, an Indigo Prophecy uh, walkthrough is pretty much a movie. Because Indigo Prophecy is like nothing but just one long quick time event. You know, it, it pretty much is a movie. If someone does a, a walkthrough of Heavy Rain, you're pretty much watching a movie. Fuck! Darn it. But with this sort of thing, there is that sense of interaction, the sense of, like, what uh, the player is going through. And I hope to, you know, be able to put that out there without screeching into the, the microphone, even though I have done that so far several times. Alright. Ah! Yeah, and I, 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 was just, I was just saying about screeching the microphone. But yeah, the, um... This is sort of the weird thing about video games, because, like, this sort of questions have never been really been brought up. I mean, no one's really been able to ever, like, record a, a session of chess and say, all right, ah, uh, oh, darn it. And, you know, say, all right, uh, we gotta cut the guy who invented chess, uh, like, some money or something. Like, hell, there have been, like, tapes of uh, poker players showing, like, their best strategies. And those are copyrighted material of the guys who, like, are came up with the strategies. But, you know, of course, the guy who invented poker, who's probably dead, uh, doesn't get a cut. Not even his family or anything. And usually the question is, like, is it within their right? Well, we don't really know if Nintendo is within their right. They, as long as they can say something, they can... Or as they, if they can convince Google that they're within their right, that's all that really matters. It might be funny that, like, uh, if this, like, whole deal was, like, blown over by the time I fucking this video uploads or something, like, uh, but I, I don't see that happening so quickly. Alright, this stage I remember specifically being a lot easier with the Hammer Brother suit, but I will not play- Ah, dang it. But I will not play with it, darn it. And sort of another interesting thing is, like, with video games, much of the appeal is knowledge, but, or like, in, in Let's Plays, it's just uh, the knowledge of the player. And here's the thing, knowledge of the game, unless you took it specifically from a book or something, it's not really that co Actually, no, not even really, even that's not really copyrighted. Maybe the words, if I outright quoted someone, uh, that could be copyrighted, but not really just knowledge. It's not exactly sending the best message of, like, putting people in... 
uh, wanting to learn more about, you know, their respective mediums. And people always want to learn more about something they really like. Oh, fuck. Alright, got it. Oh, darn. So close. I'm not really sh and like, um, I'd also like to address, like, some of the... Oh, what? Darn. I'd also like to address one other thing. I've heard, like, rampant uh, Nintendo fanboyism, but, uh, like, saying, oh, they're well within their right. No, they're not. It's, it's as simple as that. And this is not going to be good for anybody. Like, I've already heard people say they're not going to buy a bunch of certain amount of games because of this. Uh, and, you know, with the Wii U already doing terribly in sales, the, the, this, this is not doing Nintendo's, uh, uh, Nintendo any favors. And here's the thing. The money that... Oh, wow, I forgot about that fire up there. The money that Nintendo makes off... Uh, oh, wow. The first unintentional game over. Okay, uh... Well, uh, I'll continue talking when I get back to the place. To the first castle, I meant to say. Um, okay, I heard a noise that kind of indicates, like, either card games on, well, something, but the thing is, there's no card. Not sure what that means. Anyway, I'd also like to point out this. The, the, oh my god, yeah, the, the box, uh, the, the mushroom house respawned as well, so, yeah. Apparently you can cheat to get repeated amounts of, like, anything. Uh, like, in the first level, if I just deliberately game over it, I could've gotten 12 million Tanuki suits, and I died again. Alright, I'm back here. And I, I sort of like, uh, I, thought of, I thought of an interesting topic. Like, can you really copyright knowledge? Because like, at least in mediums. Like, I know there are things like trade secrets, but those are more like uh, pieces for manufacturing or tactics for talking to customers or something. But I mean, something like, uh, for example, uh, in, in if you've ever watched uh, an Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3, fighting game match with any player of Magneto who plays uh, Magneto, you'll have seen something known as the hypergravity loop. That move was in was pretty much invented by, or at least I believe, by a guy named Mollen Pie. But the thing is, he doesn't really demand that people, you know, uh, you know, pay him or anything. Because it, it's just knowledge. It's something that he discovered. Uh, you, you could, of course, copyright, like, a design you invented. But, you know, if, if it's within a spectrum that's, uh, if it's within a frame, can you, uh, can you really copyright, uh, just, like, a specific way of, of, like, painting? Like, imagine that, like, somebody said, like, the person who invented watercolors, like, said, nobody else but me can use, like, a watercolor style. That's kind of ridiculous. Anyway, the Tanuki suit made the stage much easier. Or hell, imagine if, uh, like, you know how Nintendo, uh, co-produced the, the wizard for- Oh, that's what it was! The, the Ship of Happiness, okay. I, I think what the, um, if you end a certain stage with, like, um, a specific number or something, what happens is, uh, sometimes a Hammer Brother will become, uh, sorry, a Hammer Brother will become a coin ship, and they give you lots of moonies. I just wonder why that's up there. It's like, what else is there? Is there something hidden? Uh. And the thing is, because we're kind of in a new age where this really hasn't, where a lot of the questions of, you know, what belongs to who, 
are kind of new, like, I don't know. It seems, and it seems, uh, the, the problem is like, yeah, uh, uh, the words are not coming out properly, but I think that's because I'm focusing on two things at once. Yeah, but I, I'm saying this now, Nintendo really is damaging their own relationship with their own consumer. Because, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of guys who, like, got into Super Mario Sunshine or Super Mario Galaxy through guys like Shark Conroy. I think I've been on this topic for a little too long, but something rather prevalent at the very moment I'm recording this. Anyway, here's the coin ship. It's literally just coins everywhere. Free lives. Alright. thing is, it, uh, and at the end of this, I believe you get the power-up you would have gotten from the uh, Hammer Brother. But the main benefit of this is that there really is no fight, and you're just getting a lot of coins. The only thing is, this takes kind of a while. But I believe I was talking about, like, uh, customer loyalty to companies. Oh wow, you do have to fight them. And I always wondered, like, why people seem to believe that companies really care about them in a very specific way. You know, if you had told me, uh, you know, the thing is... If- whoa, if you go to a store repeatedly, the guy will probably recognize you. Uh, but here's the thing. To whatever Nintendo ever notice you, would Sony ever notice you? Uh, I know, like, to some extent, people don't like the idea that something they really like is being marginalized by others. You know, and this is why I, I don't like the, the, the console fanboying thing. Oh, God, this level. Um, because here's the thing with the, the console fanboying. Um, you're kind of, you're defending a piece of hardware. You know, what does it matter? Shouldn't the games matter a lot more? Motherfucker. I know that's uh, something everybody has always stated, but the thing is, it's it always just comes back to, oh, the company. Here's the thing. The only reason this made remote amount of sense in, like, the Sega Genesis days was because both of the producers of the consoles were both g also game manufacturers, so they could build their own, like, exclusives. Now it really doesn't matter. Nintendo, uh, Nintendo's style has become so prevalent. Are you joking? That... You know, much of their exclusives just are the same thing that you've previously played. Because they're kind of afraid of just, uh, scaring people away with newness. Because that's exactly what happened with the GameCube stuff and the N64 stuff. You know, people didn't w uh, a lot of people didn't want to go to what they did on the N64. And a lot of people really didn't want to do with what they had on the, N on the GameCube. I think this is unorganized because I'm also missing a lot of points. Fuck! Um, and it's not even just, like, newness. A lot of times people just need the familiarity of certain things. You have to be really, really good at being, at having a brand new trend sometimes. Like, that was Nintendo's big problem with the GameCube, that they didn't have the big, big trend of the time, which was the Grand Theft Auto games. You know, they had the reputation of being childish, that they were inhibited, that they just couldn't say... They couldn't do things that were more adult. They couldn't do everything they needed to. Now technological advances are sort of, you know, not that bad. It's to the point where Nintendo, where, yeah, where even with Nintendo's, uh, fuck. Damn. I may end up deleting a whole portion of this because I, this is really unorganized. And I, I think that this is something that needs to be thought out. But my point is, like, you know, people, uh, companies sell games. The people who make the games are the people who should matter. Like, if you told me I'm loyal to Shigeru Miyamoto, I could understand that a lot more. But even so, like, you have to admit, oh, come on. You know, business tactics that are bullshit, you know, you should call them out on that. You know, why should any company be a special exception to certain rules? You know, like... Uh, like, Valve. 
Valve, I will call them out on anything. You know, I keep a close eye on their games because I think they that they make really interesting games. But I'm not gonna, you know, like bat an eye when they do something really bad. I'll be like, Gabe, what the fuck are you doing? Right, where's the control shell? And that's the sort of thing. Like, don't, don't go like. Don't be, uh, someone, don't be like someone in an abusive relationship and just, like, try to justify everything they do with stupid-ass logic. You know, if someone does something bad, they should be called out on it. Alright. Took me forever to realize that's what you're supposed to do when I was younger. Yeah, and the th thing about company loyalty... It, it always just came, comes off like very pointless to me, but I think this is because I have most of the, I've got I've attained a decent enough economic condition in which I have the ability to play most games. And you know what? A lot of people can. Like, like if somebody tells me, "Oh, everyone should join the PC Master Race or whatever," you know what? A lot of people can't afford it. Like my, my rig to play uh, a lot of computer games cost me a thousand dollars. Like, I'm gonna tell you right now, if I didn't make YouTube videos, oh dear, uh, I probably wouldn't have done that because I made the, I upgraded this rig specifically for, uh, making games because I wanted to upgrade my editing software because anytime I tried to do anything in any kind of high performance format, it was just dead. It, w it had like this, the, my editors had the slowest frame rate and I just couldn't work with a lot of things. Uh, and you know what? The the big thing about PC games, the problem is the price. The other problem I had was controllers, but then I figured out how to control, uh, how to p connect a bunch of controllers to the um, uh, to the PC. Like I now have a way to you to use a PS3 controller, an Xbox 360 controller, and a Wii mote, which I'm actually using right now, uh, on my uh, on my computer. But you know what? A lot of people don't have that. A lot of people may, like, shove knowledge down our throat, or try to, like, shove knowledge superiority down our throat, but you know what? Not a lot of people have been in computers for that long. Like, I pretty much grew up with computers because my dad has always needed one because he's a, an accountant. But what about the people who didn't? You know, like, I remember hearing somebody, like, uh, I think it was Spoonie when he did a review of Ultima, that, uh, of the Ultima games, that he said he kind of dreaded every time an, a new Ultima game came out because even though he loved the games, he knew he would have to upgrade his computer every time and it would cost a shitload of money. I couldn't have that. Like, it, uh, like, uh, I, I'm, I need to be, I'm currently facing the prospect of possibly needing to upgrade my graphics card and it, that could cost me anywhere from like 300 to $500. And, you know, I'm not looking forward to that. And whoa, a lot of hammer. Oh, whoa, whoa, okay, okay. I think I've run out of room. I've run out of room. I need to use stuff. Uh, all right. Uh, I'll kill you in 10 seconds. Oh, but then it'll give me a new item. Whatever. Wow, it was fast. Oh, wunderbar. But I will say this, that uh, accessibility into the PC market is becoming a little bit easier. Uh, now that everything is sort of becoming a little more... Um, uh, standardized, like USB is pretty much going to be a stand. It's pretty much the standard. Uh, there are there are some there are some good ways to connect your some bit more simple ways to connect your PS3 controller, or your Xbox 360 controller, or whatever you really want to your computer. Uh, all right, oh, darn it. Um, so for for example, for for your Xbox 360 controller, all you need to do is literally get like a wired one. A wired Xbox 360 controller and connect it to your computer. If you have Windows 7 or 8, it automatically installs. Um, or like, or just like d download a driver if it doesn't. Darn it. Uh, PS3, there's something like called Motion Enjoy that you can get. Uh, and that is actually quite beneficial as well. Most of these programs are actually free if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the, for the Wii, uh, or for, like, the Wiimote, well, the Wiimote is probably the most complicated one, because you'd need a, uh, what do you need? A, 
a Bluetooth adapter, which a lot of laptops already have. Um, ah, darn it. And like Glove Pie. Just one program and you have to write in scripts. Although I noticed the big problem with like PC controllers is like always it has the most tedious process of like mapping con uh, functions to your controllers. Like, I swear to God, if you get emulators, that's what you're gonna spend your first like five minutes doing, like figuring out, oh, how is the controls comfortable? Sometimes they are, uh, sometimes like scripts will already come in, but of course they're not pre designed with the standards of emulators or computer games. Anyway, uh, I think I was talking about the, the lack of ease of access of PC games, but the, 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 the main thing is, like, don't try to freaking defend something just because it's yours, alright? If it's yours, then accept its flaws and its benefits. But don't just start talking shit about uh, other companies' stuff just because you don't have it or something. I've also heard the argument that, um, fuck, I'm rambling randomly, aren't I? I believe I am. What the? I have been glitched. There is an invisible block there of happiness or sadness. Whoa! Whoa! Yo, dog! Check this out. That whoa. Sounds pretty sick, actually. Okay. And thankfully, I will say that for the PC market, it, it will probably become much more accessible because of graphics um, upgrades. Like, uh, we have been plateauing very slowly for the past five years. Um, so expect pretty much all graphics cards within like five more years to play, be able to play every game from now, including probably Crisis. Which is pretty much still the top tier, if I'm not mistaken. And FYI, my computer can run Crisis, but it only does it like at 24 frames. And like, my computer starts making crazy noise. Alright. This is probably the, the longest I have ever not talked about what's going on. In the game. That is, in many ways, that is a very bad sign as me of a, a Let's Player, but I think that depends on what type of Let's Play you really want. Uh, the more heavily informative Let's Plays, I think those are pro I think those are probably best for games that are really hard. Because a lot of the knowledge in these games are very easy easily uh, accessible and not always best for... Ah. Not always best for the Let's Play format. However, really hard games... If you have mastered a game to the point where you are not, um, or to the point where you can just destroy everything, and you are above far, and you are far above even the most standard player, like anyone who can consider themselves a standard player, then that's where I think a good Let's Player can really make a difference, because it can make, it can, like, it can supply the appropriate amount of information, while also displaying a very excellent walkthrough. Like, that's where I think the more informative style is a little better. Alright. I, I try to do something where uh, I'm almost, like, reviewing it while I'm playing it, but the problem is, like, then... Uh, I've heard people complain that I, um... Fuck. That I, like, criticize games too much when I... Darn it. When I play them. And that's always a sort of issue, like, why would you play something if you don't like it? Here's the thing, you can like something and still find flaws in it. Alright, um, how about this? Resident Evil 4, uh, has... Has kind of slow aim, uh, turning aiming. I wish you could put, uh, you could change the sensitivity so that you could move a little bit faster. Because a lot of times, you just know when enemy is around you, or, like, just within your, uh, within, like... Is like at 90 degrees too, so like moving 180 degrees is impractical, but like just turning is too slow. Um, some of the enemies in Resident Evil 4 are really cheap. Like, there are too many circumstances in which uh, you can just straight up lose, too much, uh, lose a lot of health for being in like a wrong circumstance. And the hard mode is the lazy type of hard mode where you. 
uh, where you can't really... <clears throat> or, no, where it's just like, oh, you take more damage and you have less health. Alright? So, th those are all the falls I brought in Resident Evil 4. Resident Evil 4 is my favorite game of all time. You can always find faults, but you can always find... But as long as, like, you give it kind of a fair reason why you do... Why you, you know, say what you want. Ah. Uh, if you uh, say what you say, if you will. You can always find faults in something, and uh, uh, it's... I'd like to think that I'm adding something to, like, just saying... Uh, by just adding some sort of knowledge to it. Mm. That was rambly. Oh, oh, I keep forgetting you can't twist your tail uh, while swimming. And here's the other thing. I also got this um, criticism when I was uh, doing Cutting Through the Hype. You know, uh, how dare you mock these games. They are so important. Here's the thing. Things can mean a lot. And you can still bring up the problems in them. Just because something is flawed doesn't make it not important. Just because something is flawed doesn't mean it doesn't have meaning. You know, there are a lot of games that I'm sure you you look at and they, uh, that, that I'm sure you guys have, and you're like, this game kind of sucks, but at the same time, I really like it. You know, Batman Forever is arguably the worst game I've ever played, but you know what? I kind of like it because I it's actually one of the first games I ever have an active memory of getting. Like, I remember the di on, like, my birthday, when I was really, really young, my dad, I think he told me, like, oh yeah, check the car, and I found two games in there, uh, Batman Forever and, uh, Warriors Woods. Warriors Woods is a way better game, but, you know, when you have that sort of association, there's a lot of meaning to things. And that does not necessarily diminish if the product is flawed. For example, Batman Forever is horrendously flawed. The game sucks. But you know what? It kind of has meaning for me. And I'm sure there are a lot of other games like that. I'm sure a ton of people were introduced to Super Mario 64 as their first game ever. You know, and I'm pretty sure they took offense to me, you know, kind of saying, oh, this doesn't work as well. But you know what? It just means it's flawed. Something is can be flawed. You know, but to you, it can still be perfect. Perfect, you know, someone can find flaws in something, but do they really mean anything to you? I think that's what ultimately matters. Like, I said Ninja Gaiden was frustratingly hard, but for a lot of people, that's part of it. That's part of what they want. You know, not necessarily a brokenly hard game, but um, just a chance where you can be frustrated. You can feel like something is unfair to you, but you also know that you can still win. You know, people have argued that video games are a way of supplementing things that we just can't get in real life, and something that we can't get in real life in many cases is a feeling that even when things are really, really hard, we can always win, and, you know, super frustrating games actually kind of have that. Oh dear, I shouldn't have done that, darn it. Like this game, I have been bashing, I just spent like, what, maybe two videos bashing Nintendo. Ba Nintendo still has a lot of meaning to me, I just don't have any faith in the company. I really, I'm, and I'm not gonna have any kind of loyalty to a company that, you know, I don't really know. But I think this is because I, I sort of have the implication of trust individual people, don't trust a company. Uh, I think, what, what was it in, um, Men in Black where they said, uh, uh, humans are smart, people are idiots. And, you know, it's like, people in groups are idiots, but individuals can do amazing things. Alright, so I'm also immune to... Whoa, I didn't know there was stuff up there. But, uh, people in groups will do the stupidest things ever. And it's ironic, because, uh, humans in groups have the most potential, but they, uh, but they most often will not do as much as they can. Darn it. Although I think that speaks to the drive of uh, an individual versus the capability of a group. A group has to all be uh, directed towards one in darn it, towards one ideal. You know, and a lot of times there is not that drive. And a, one person can be incredibly driven, but he can only do so much as one. I'm getting way too abstract here. So 
now I'm a little iffy about what I'm going to do after the after Survivor of the Stream. I'm thinking the next one is going to be um, either Resident Evil 2 or Beautiful Joe. I don't know, some kind of... I don't have any kind of marking out dumb for, like, Capcom. Uh, but those are just two that I think would be interesting to play. I was also uh, uh, thinking of Resident Evil Zero, but I actually don't like Resident Evil Zero. So I think that would just be like me complaining for three hours about a game that I don't like doing, um, that has a style I'm not a fan of. The, the style of Resident Evil Zero is kind of meticulous. It's about uh, being meticulous with everything you do and remembering where you, every, where you placed everything. And I'm not that sort of uh, player. I'm that sort of guy who's meticulous at the beginning, but he doesn't like. To, but because of that, he doesn't like to leave anything in, the, in a place where I have to waste time getting it back. And that's kind of what you do a lot in Resident Evil Zero. Oh my God! All right. This guy, and he's done. <sighs> I think I was talking earlier about how a lot of people find meaning in being very frustrated at an unfair game, but it's always uh, the question of uh, it's hard, but is it rewarding? You know, the the, the hard for games has the best example of this. Uh, they they had the best example of this, and here's another sprite from Super Mario World. What the heck? I thought I thought about the surprise from Super Mario Brothers too, huh? But yeah, Hardcore Games had one of the best examples of this. It was um, it was like you know the new Battle Kid. It's hard, but it's rewarding. But then you go to Guantanamo Bay and you get waterboarded. You know, waterboarding is hard, but it isn't rewarding. You know, and it's always hard to say like what is rewarding. What is it? How does it feel to be like, I made so I did something. It, it like I had did something that had meaning. And a lot of times, what can really kill it is like uh, the context of the narrative. Like I know a lot of people, because a lot of NES games were not only hard but had just crappy, crappy endings. They were completely unrewarding to finish. It's like, what was that? All that in Ada, like just a text screen where they like say we won't tell if Jason died or whatever. That's what's always tricky about trying to make things difficult. I tried playing Demon Souls, and you know, it's like, it's like, fuck, that game is hard, but I'm just doing the same thing over and over again. It feels like just a war of attrition. I'm not sure whether I'm spending my time properly there. Oh fuck, is it me to it? What? Ah, damn. Well, whatever. Anyway, looks like we finished up this one. And I think this is so far the world that I have talked about the actual game the least. I think I've, I've sort of just been in the con contemplative mindset because of the thing I started talking about earlier. Which, who knows, maybe Nintendo has responded to all the criticism by the time I've actually posted this up. And my god, that king is terrifying. He looks like a potato with hair. Alright, the next world is the most annoying thing ever, but still. Greetings. I am well. Please retrieve the magic whistle hidden in the darkness at the end of the third world. Wait, what? At the whistle at the end of the darkness at the end of the third world. That's really vague. Does that mean, like, the first world, but, like, behind the cat? Yeah, I think that's what it's referring to, because that's the only uh, whistle I'm aware of in any kind of third world. Anyway, we got another P-Wing. Yep, this world. Join me next time on Let's Play Super Mario Bros. 3, and we're going to take it on. See you guys then.